Rock Chalk Springbok, this is not a TikTok. No, far from it. We're looking at radar fundamentals for fun people. I'm Steve, and let's dive into some new aircraft. Who this? Exploring radar identifications, methods, and techniques as set up by the 7110.65, Chapter 5, Section 3, to be exact, radar identification. If you are in the stage training for radar at San Juan, well, this is a great way to go over some fundamentals and some techniques on how to properly radar identify aircraft that you will be working not only in the lab in the 2 and 8 environment, but when you go up to the OJT environment as well. Looking to have a great time, not too long of a video, going through some methods. We'll go through real quick. If you need some source material, you can always look up the 7110, always free on a PDF to supplement what you're going to learn today. Like I said, my name is Steve, wearing a PSA shirt. Here we are, let's dive in. I'll see you at the next slide. All right, new aircraft, who this? The old school primary way, numero uno. Let's jump into it. We know that there are basically two ways to identify aircraft as outlined by the 7110. They usually call it primary methods, which does not involve any kind of automation uh, whatsoever, not really requiring, uh, depending on almost like you would say the computer aspect of uh, the radar scope. But this is old school, um, just, hey, look into scope and seeing something happen, and that's how you do it. So let's start without further ado, the old school primary way. Here we go. Observing a departing aircraft within one mile of the takeoff runway and at airports with an operating control tower, provided one of the following methods of coordination is accomplished. A verbal rolling boundary notification is issued for each departure. A nonverbal rolling boundary notification is used for each departure aircraft. Well, interesting. You don't see this too much here at San Juan, at least as a center controller. One of the contract towers that we work is Aguadilla Tower, and they usually don't give rolling calls. Here and there they will, and they'll take you by surprise, and you might even wonder why they're calling you, letting you know the guy's on the roll, but this is because they're trying to help you radar identify this aircraft faster. So, like I said, it doesn't happen too often here at San Juan Center, but sometimes the uh, Barinkin Tower Controller will give you a call and say, hey, this guy's on the roll. So let's take a look at an example here, a little freeze frame action via Microsoft Paint. Let's dive into that, and I'll see you in the next slide. All right, so here we are. We're looking at a blank scope. We sat down, we took the briefing, and the controller who just got relieved advised us that there is an aircraft released it is not airborne yet and it's Amplite 8110. So we look at the scope and we see a discrete beacon code kind of floating over the Aguadilla class uh, Delta overlay there on the map. Now you might be wondering why it didn't auto acquire already if it's already being surveilled by a radar source. Well, that's true because the Brinken radar sensor is basically on the airport grounds, but there's a polygon that is drawn around that area and it blocks out auto acquisition taking place so you don't get any false starts. Uh, so you don't have to worry about aircraft taxiing, squawking their beacon code and departing the aircraft and kind of messing everything up. So you see this and you sit down, you're plugged in and you get this call real quick. You hear the, hear the shout line, R8 Aguadilla Tower, Amplite 8110 rolling runway eight. And you think to yourself, well, well, thanks. And you reply with, Aguadilla R8, Amplite A110, Rolling Roger. Well, that's great, because guess what? They just helped you satisfy the requirement of radar identification method, primary radar identification method that we just talked about. So as soon as you see that Amplite 8110, you can say radar contact, and that's just about it, depending on the quality of the check-in. So real simple here, real simple stuff, simple dialogue. Like I said, doesn't happen too often, but sometimes that R8, or correction, that uh, Aguadilla Tower Controller will throw you a bone and uh, you'll be able to radar identify the aircraft uh, right away. So we will see you on the next slide and see how this plays out. Boom, beautiful, look at that. Amplite 8110, auto acquired because the aircraft had a ground speed associated with it, had a climbing altitude. And let's just say for the sake of uh, the suspension of disbelief that this aircraft did auto acquire within one mile of the uh, end of the runway to take off end of the runway. So boom, what comes up? San Juan Center, Amplite 8110, 2,200, climbing 5,000. That's a great check-in, so wonderful, making our job real easy here. And all we have to reply with is Amplite 8110, San Juan Center, radar contact. Perfect, you can add to your instructions on there, climb and maintain about 230, leaving 4,000, clear direct Hillary, whatever you wanna do. But as simple as it is, um, 
if the tower controller does give you a rolling call, the only kind of rolling call they can give you since we don't really have anything automated related with the tower over there, hey, you know, it makes your life easier and you are on your way to mastering this form of radar identification. So yet again, we will see you on the next method. Really excited about this one. I think you'll enjoy it. See you there. All right, moving along with new aircraft, who this? The old school primary way number two. Here we go, observing a target whose position with respect to a fix corresponds with the direct position report received from the aircraft and the observed track is consistent with the reported heading and route of flight. Now, if you look in the 7110 for this, when you, you know, peruse it for your light spring reading, there's a whole bunch of stuff, fluff in there that describes what exactly satisfy these requirements. So we'll talk about uh, VORs and take-ins near the radar site, near the actual radar antenna, and what satisfies this requirement, whether it's scribed on the mat overlay or on your video map. So just if you want to be more exact in this application, you can obviously look up the 7110 there in, in the paragraph, read what was in between, but try to make, give you a little abridged version there. So um, this might sound a little confusing, but basically we're just saying, hey, you see a target, they call you up, and as long as their report is consistent with what you're seeing on the scope, boom, you have radar identified the aircraft, and uh, you can uh, radar identify the aircraft at your leisure. So let's take a look at how that looks on a uh, radar freeze frame. See you there. Boom, we are on the southwest side of the island looking at a target over Mayanguez. Yet again, we sat down, we're plugged in, and look, we see Boom, a 1200 code, likely a VFR aircraft, 1300, somewhere around Mayanguez. We see a little uh, history trail there of what the aircraft did, maybe a slight maneuver to the southeast and then turning to the north a little bit. And uh, boom, we get this message coming over the frequency, San Juan Center, KR 55, four miles north, East Mayanguez Airport, 1300, request advisories, San Juan. Man, what a great check-in. If only... Every check-in can be like that from every VFR pilot that we work, right? Well, our job is a lot easier because guess what? You look at the scope and you say, yeah, that is exactly where that care is. It is consistent with what I'm looking at or what you're looking at on the screen. And boom, CARE 55, San Juan Center, radar contact. That's it. You don't even have to verify the altitude. You got an altitude leaving, a mode C readout. Boom. Wonderful primary method. And it makes it so much easier when the pilots say the right thing and it limits what you have to say. So it's great. So this dialogue that you're having, as long as everybody's going by the script, makes life a lot easier on the frequency. So we'll uh, take a look at the, the third option here uh, coming up hot. See you there. All right, new aircraft, who this? The old school primary way number three or uh, glorious bastards, uh, three, right? The, the German way, uh, observing a target. Uh, make identifying turns of 30 degrees or more provided the following conditions are met. Here we go, except in the case of a lost aircraft. So don't be doing this to student pilots who might be my lost, uh, who might be lost, um, you know, doing uh, a lesson or on a solo or something like that. A pilot position report is received, which assures you that the aircraft is within radar coverage and within the area of being displayed. Okay, good, that's good to know. Only one aircraft is observed making these turns. So if you're gonna use this method, just do it one aircraft at a time. Don't have multiple aircraft pending, uh, doing 30 degree turns out there, performing small air shows across the airspace. Just do it one at a time. For aircraft operating with an ordinance with an IFR clearance, so we're talking IFR guys here, so uh, just use this carefully, right? Especially if you know you're dealing with IFR, right? An IFR aircraft. You either issue a heading away from an area which will require an increased minimum IFR altitude or have the aircraft climb to highest minimum altitude in your area of jurisdiction before you issue a heading. So this is this little caveat here, this bullet point number three, uh, is almost a cautionary tale. It, it almost kind of talks you out of using this procedure or this particular method for IFR aircraft. And I can tell you just from my limited ATC experience that I've never used uh, identifying turns um, for aircraft, just for that very reason, at least IFR, IFR aircraft anyways. And uh, now with the advent of ADS-B being almost a universal concept in the NAS, uh, and ADS-B being a universal concept even for our foreign users down here in the Caribbean, um, this way isn't, um, I can just say, I just, we don't use it all too often. So if you, maybe if you are a pilot who has ever uh, been radar identified this way, or if you're a controller from a different facility and you do use this way, just, hey, give me a heads up. I would love to know more about it. But 
uh, not too much experience on this one. So let's take a look at what this looks like uh, on the radar scope. We'll see you there. So boom, welcome back. We have this uh, forlorn, lonely looking empty R2 sector. And we're sitting there and we see a target pop up and we can already deduce by our settings is a VFR target squawking 1200 at a mode C altitude of 165, unverified, however, and this comes up over the waves. San Juan Center, Goodspeed 101, Bravo, flight level 165, request advisories to San Juan. Now, we can use deductive reasoning and see that this aircraft, whether through institutional knowledge, we've been sitting on the sector a while, or we've just been working at San Juan Center and working R2 for a while, and know that good speeds, aka trade with aviation, Lattice PC-12s usually expect VFR advisories from that very position. Now, like I said, sometimes this radar identification method um, almost talks uh, you out of using it because one more transmission on the controller part on your part could say good speed 101 Bravo, safe position. But for the sake of example and for the sake of a darn good time, let's just oblige and follow this um, this method, 30 degree turn. So the suspension of disbelief is out there, so good. So what are we hitting back with? Well, good speed 101 Bravo, San Juan Center, turn 30 degrees left, vector radar identification. Right? Anytime we give a vector, we usually state the purpose why, and um, that's it, a phrase that fits. And let's wait to see the result of that turn and uh, see how it goes. So I will see you on the next slide to uh, finish up and get in this good speed radar identified. See you there. Okay, so we're chilling here, and uh, a couple sweeps go by, and we see the course of that target change, right? The 1200 165 code change, and it looks about like 30 degrees, right? Well, there's no other targets out there, so it kind of breaks it down, right? Kind of narrows it down to who it is, but we see it. We're satisfied with the performance of the turn, and boom, looks like 30 degrees. I'll say so. And good speed 101 Bravo, radar contact 165 miles southeast of the San Juan Airport. I already checked in with altitude, so we don't have to verify the mode C again. Maybe throw in an altimeter there for him if you wanted to or something like that. But right now, that's it. And hopefully, you would follow this up with assigning a discrete beacon code for the aircraft, a VFR code, and providing advisories back to the San Juan Airport. Really simple in practice, or at least in this uh, vacuum environment that we're working with, sounds simple. I would probably advise using the other methods of radar identification, but it's good and uh, prudent that you learn everything and at least try to visualize what it looks like. So let's go and um, sum this one up with a bullet list and uh, I'll see you on the next slide. All right, so the old school primary way number threes continued distance on the good speed 101 Bravo. What gives? That's good. If you have been paying attention and as astute as you are, imagine you have your like Steve. We didn't give a distance with the uh, care off of Mayaguez or the am flight off of Aguadilla. What's up with that, man? Well, the 7110 uh, chapter five, when talking about primary radar identification methods, they have this caveat, and I broke it down and just took out the parts that's applicable to this particular instance. Inform an aircraft of its position whenever radar identification is established by means of identifying turns. Always. Just do it. It kind of makes sense, right? Because you had the aircraft turn, and it's best that you get on the same page with the pilot on the distance from the airport that they're going to, in this case, it's San Juan, right? All the other methods had you and the pilot or you, the controller and the pilot, all on the same page, right? Like in the case of the Amplite, you, the, the R8 controller, the local controller at Aguadilla, and the pilot are on the same page, right? They gave you a rolling call, aircraft knows where it's at, you know where the aircraft's at, not only on radar, but the Aguadilla controller told you as well. And the CARE gave a perfect check-in a perfect distance off my was and you guys were on the same page here not so much so just settle the score and just say hey we're on the same page here you're this distance away from the san juan airport boom that's you that's good and as i said when we were on the uh freeze frame you should follow this up giving a vfr beacon code and providing wonderful services back to the san juan airport so wonderful, good job with this. I hope you understood it. Like I said, 7110 provides some great background info. And uh, that's basically it for the primary methods. Let's dive into some fun automated beacon methods. 
in the next uh, couple slides. I'll see you there. Are we having fun yet? I know I am. I hope you guys are too. New aircraft, who this? Beacon slash ADSB. Whoa, fancy 2020, baby. Identification methods, aka the cool kid way to identify aircraft number one. And that's right, number one. This is cool and it is a neat way to do it. This way is a little bit easier than the ways before. Not exactly easier, but it keeps you in control of, uh, of what you're doing because you're using beacon methods, right? What your radar uses to present information to you on your scope. That's what you're using. You're not depending upon the rolling call or uh, a pilot's position report or a pilot turning 30 degrees, you know, adjusting their course 30 degrees to identify them. No, this is uh, an automated computer way of doing it. So Without further ado, let's jump right into it. Simple bullet point. Request the pilot to activate the IDENT feature of the transponder slash ADSB and then observe the identification display. Sounds simple, sounds cool. Let's take a look at what it actually looks like on the scope. See you there. Boom, welcome back. We are back in sector two. And guess what? We're talking about good speed again because this is a wonderful, wonderful instance, a common instance, and a much happening occurrence uh, in the R2 environment where you have uh, lots of EFR aircraft requesting advisories and uh, all kind of opportunities for you to use different, uh, not only primary methods like we just learned, but also beacon methods as well. So you're sitting there by your lonesome and boom, San Juan Center goes to be 101 Bravo, at Bevel. Flight level 165 request advisories to San Juan. Well, good, he gave you an altitude, still no position report. So, you know, not the best check-in that you'd want, but hey, this is great for you to use your beacon method. So, boom, here you go. Good speed 101 Bravo, San Juan Center, ident. Perfect, right? A simple command, a simple reply to that, right? So, that's it, that's it, ident. And we will see what exactly that looks like on a MIARTS data block with a mode C intruder, not in a full data block, right? But what it looks like when an aircraft identifies and they, are, they don't have a full uh, track on the aircraft, full call sign, beacon code type of aircraft, scratch pad entry and stuff like that. So let's take a look at what that's gonna look like on the next slide. I'll see you there. So here we are, and you see the image has changed just ever so slightly. An I and a D, an India and a Delta are now flashing those little beams of golden rays of sunshine flashing on that target ident. That's how uh, an aircraft identing is shown to us using micro EARTs. Now, this may not be true for all radar systems, whether you're talking about ERAM or STARS, but here in micro EARTs, that's the way it looks, and it flashes. Easy enough, ID takes all the guesswork out, and we follow that up with, boom, could speed. 111 Bravo, radar contact 165 miles southeast of the San Juan Airport. Perfect, simple, easy, done. You're gonna notice a trend here. Every time we use a beacon method, we will use a distance when we radar identify the aircraft from a, from a point, from a fix. We are going to do that. So get used to it, it's fun. It's a good way for you to uh, start to know the uh, innards of your airspace, uh, the proximity of targets to certain fixes, the distances associated with your preferential settings. It's just a great way to get you really involved and intimately uh, knowledgeable about your working environment. So here we go. Let's take a look at another method here coming up shortly. All right, we're looking at the cool kid way to identify aircraft number two. Request the pilot to change to a specific discrete beat or non-discrete beacon code as appropriate and then observe the target or code display change. Real simple here right? You see an aircraft, you ask them to squawk something, whether you make up the call sign or correction, if you make up that code or you don't, or you use a, a function code or a canned uh, code that is made available to you um, at, the, the, at the position level. So really simple here. Let's take a look at what that's going to look like. I'm sure you can visualize what it's going to look like in your own mind, but let's try to paint a picture here and uh, get going. Boom, so look at that. We have a 1200 code off of my Wes, right? Not talking to us. And uh, we break the silence, or they break the silence with this. San Juan Center, November 6, 6, uh, correction, 6, 9 or 6, Romeo. And you, knowing that our plan is to have them squawk a discrete beacon code, let's just use a discrete beacon code in this case. 
Uh, November 6, Niner 6, Romeo, San Juan Center, Squawk 0531. Easy enough. I, I just make up 0531. Actually, to be honest with you, whenever I'm working and I need to put a code in on the fly, whether it's putting in an IFR flight plan, uh, more often than not, or assigning a beacon code to a departure and it doesn't have a beacon code yet, my go-to is 0531. It's like my lucky code. So maybe it'll bring you some luck. I have no idea. But uh, simple as that. Let's see how this looks, how it's changed. You can imagine what it's going to look like, right? That 1200 is going to turn into the code we assigned. Um, nothing else is uh, spectacular is really going to happen, but we're going to be able to radar identify the aircraft nonetheless. So I will see you in the next slide. All right, party people, here we are, back again. 0531 has popped up. The aircraft is inched a little bit northeast of the Mayaguez Airport, and they are squawking. That's who they are. And boom, and we hit them back with November 6, 96 Romeo radar contact five miles northeast of the Mayaguez Airport. The same altimeter, 29er. Uh, nine or eight say altitude, right? We didn't get no altitude mode C verification and initial call. That's fine. We were able to take care of all that now. We gave a local altimeter setting, which we're supposed to do every time an aircraft is in our area of jurisdiction and 0531 popped up. And yet again, just like the instance with the good speed, we should follow this up with giving a VFR a beacon code or putting in a BFR flight plan for this aircraft because they just made their intentions and they want advisories back to San Juan. So it'd be good to put in that BFR flight plan and follow through with all of that, get a strip on the aircraft and just follow through with that. So yet again, a method that I would not see using a lot here at San Juan. Um, maybe this satisfies whenever you give the assigned beacon code to an aircraft entering an airspace entering your airspace from a foreign facility when they had a different code from, say, maybe PRCO. They were squawking one particular code for PRCO, and you know that they're going to squawk uh, a discrete beacon code entering the San Juan airspace. You could probably use it that way. I didn't use that example because you will use that all the time whenever you sit down on position at San Juan. You'll be so used to giving an aircraft a new code at the boundary, right? At Hillary, squawk this. At Modic, squawk this. At Anata, squawk this. Or sometimes you use the code from Piarco and you get the auto acquisition, which we will talk about. Another instance where I see this would be useful is maybe if you had a whole bunch of targets, maybe populated between Mayaguez and Barankin, which on nice days, sometimes you do get that. You'll have a whole bunch of aircraft flying and somebody calls you up Yet again, there's nothing wrong with putting in a quick VFR flight plan and getting a discrete beacon code that's going to cause auto acquisition to take place. But maybe you just want to see yourself, see your way through the weeds and look at this aircraft and you see the code change on one aircraft out of all the maybe four or five 1200 codes you got there. At least one of them now pops up with the beacon code that you just assigned. I could see that being uh, useful. But for the rest of the part, this one's very simple as well. And yet another tool in your toolbox for radar identifying aircraft. See you at the next method. Okay, we're at beacon method, the cool kid way method number three. Huh, got it right that time. Uh, request the pilot to change their transponder ADSB to stand by after you observe the target disappear for sufficient scans to assure the loss of target resulted from placing the transponder ADSB in standby. Position, request the pilot to return transponder to normal operation and observe the reappearance of the target. So basically, what are you doing? Yet again, you are having the aircraft basically turn off their transponder so you see a target appear, maybe amongst a lot of targets, and you see it disappear. And then once you see it disappear for the ample number of scans, you ask them to squawk whatever again, or excuse me, turn back on their, their transponder, and you see it populate your scope again. Yet again, a method that I do not use often. I can't say that I've ever used it before, um, but it's never uh, bad or adverse for you to know all of your options, right? To be completely aware of every option you have to write on a aircraft. Because maybe someday, you know, somewhere down the way when you're working by yourself and you have exhausted every other option and this one works or the one that we talked before or a primary method works, for you, you'll be happy that you did know about it. So let's take a look at what that looks like on the radar scope uh, in the next slide. We'll see you there. All right, you crazy people, here we are. And look, we have a plethora, well, three of targets 
around the Ponce Barincan Maiguez area. All squawking 1200, all just having a great time flying around on what was probably a perfect, beautiful day in the Caribbean. And we are just watching that, and none of them are getting services from us right now. So, hey, we're just letting them have a good time out there. And boom, we are hit with this. San Juan Center, Baron 5070 Juliet, request advisories to Isla Grande. Well, perfect. It's a fine check-in, right? We know the aircraft's intentions. We know who they are. So we got a call sign, even though we weren't expecting it. And let's just say our ears were perked up and we are fit and ready to take on this guy. And we say, well, who that? Now, it's a good question as any, but of course you're not saying that's why it's an asterisk. There you go. Baron 570 Julia Squawk Standby. Sam on Altimeter 3000. Good. They're going to squawk standby. So now what are we looking for? We're looking for one of these targets to disappear, to kind of fall off the face of the earth and then reappear. So let's take a look at how that will look um, on the next freeze frame slide. See you there. Boom. Couple sweeps later. And look, we see one of the targets. There is no longer a beacon code nor mode C readout associated with that target. And we get a boom. Baron 570 Juliet, radar contact seven miles west of the Maguas VRDB squawk normal. Yet again, you see we gave a distance related to a fix. Why? Because we are using what I would consider to be kind of dicey. And why do I say dicey? It's because when you work at a facility that is located on an island and your radar scanners are scanning a little bit of land and lots of water, and your radios and the radar line of sight is sometimes suspect in various areas, that area being one of them, you definitely want to make sure that you are on the same page with the pilot and they know that you know where they are and everybody's on the same page. And that distance verification, you giving that exact distance from a known fix, from a fix that they will know, will totally eliminate just about all doubt and give you peace of mind. And sure enough, um, we would follow that up with a squawk normal, and then we would see the target reappear. And just like we mentioned before, knowing the aircraft's intentions, their requests, we would follow up with putting in a VFR flight plan. Now, I will say this, that just about every situation we just seen here, at least with relation to VFR aircraft, it would be probably in your best interest um, to put in a VFR flight plan, right? It's a very simple entry, an entry that you will use all the time. You will be trained on it. It will be ingrained in your head, and it's just an extra layer of, I don't even want to say safety, just peace of mind and relative ease to take care of these radar identification methods. But it's always good, like I said before, to have these in your tool belt. So I hope you're enjoying this so far, um, and we'll see you on the next slide. All right. All right, last but certainly not least, we will move on to the new aircraft to this, the Cool Kid Weight Identifier Aircraft number about oh. AK way, or correction, AKA the best way, in serio. Uh, it is, it really is. It's probably the most used method you will utilize during your tenure here at San Juan Center. Actually, probably um, the most often you'll use this when you work sectors two and eight and most of sector four. And let's dive right into it. An aircraft may be considered radar identified when the full data block is automatically associated with the target symbol of an aircraft that is squawking discrete beacon code assigned by the computer. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if the aircraft is squawking a code that coincides with the beacon code that is in your tabular list, right? The tab list that is somewhere on your scope, depending on your press settings, micro yards will do its best to take the radar data given by what that aircraft is squawking and pair it with a track that is stored in the tab list, like you'll see in the example. This is for en route only. Sorry, terminal peeps, can't help you there. You guys gotta use the other methods. This is for um, the flight level folk only. <laughs> anyway, uh, depending on the proximity of the target to a surveillance source, a radar site, or an ADSB station, auto acquisition will take place immediately if the aircraft is squawking, the discrete beacon go to sign by the computer. That's a note I just put in there. So you'll see at San Juan Center, our, we have multiple radar sensors. We have multiple ADSB ground stations scattered throughout the islands. And you'll see how fast it occurs when an aircraft squawks uh, the assigned beacon code that the computer expects it to. That auto acquisition takes place, boom. It's, uh, it'll take a couple sweeps in some areas for my career to say, hey, is this guy oh, I know who this guy is. I'm going to auto acquisition for the controller. And just like that, lickety-split, 
it, it's going to auto acquire and you'll be able to radar identify the aircraft. So let's take a look at what it looks like on the screen in real life and uh, we'll see you there. Well, here we are sitting on an R8 section. We have a little scenario set up for you. You see a target uh, down south of our airspace in Cure South Center's airspace. And I even put the tab list up there for you. You have a couple aircraft in your tablet and the tab list that are going to be entering the sector here soon. You have Delta 722. American 2295 and TAM 8186 all do in the sector uh, 15 min in 15 minutes time or less. So sure enough, and you look, and I'm sure you can deduce this already, you see that code is going to be 0522 at flight level 350. And look, what do you got going on? You have a Delta 722 squawk and 0522 as assigned by the computer. And... Um, Boom, you're hit with this. Sam wants there, Delta 722, flight level 350. Good. He didn't, the aircraft did not give a position report, which is fine. You know, we're, we're trying to educate here on this particular method, and they gave an altitude. That's pretty good. Boom, look at that. You know, or the computer definitely knows, that you have Delta 722 squawk and 0522. So in no time, in lickety split, that mode C intruder looking target, but there's a squawk and a altitude and a little bit of target history and a leader line is going to turn into a full data block that will make radar identification a breeze. So I will see you on the next slide and we will complete uh, this method. So boom, look at that. Delta 722 pops up less than one second later. Boom, gone from the tab list. It was shifted from the tab list and all the information that was stored in the tab list is now centered on the target. MicroYards matched it for you all has taken place within usually less than one second. It depends on if that aircraft is actively being swept by one of the radar sensors or an ADSB ground station. So it's perfect. You see the, the auto acquisition take place and nothing's precluding you now from doing a simple Delta 722 SAM 1 Center radar contact, eight miles south Kappa. Perfect. Easy, breezy, wonderful, uh, great way to radar identify aircraft, a great way to radar identify aircraft in our facility in particular, given the fact that we are surrounded by foreign facilities that we may not be using the same beacon codes. Or sometimes if you are using the same beacon codes as the foreign facility, whether you copy it down or input it when you activate the flight plan as a D side, which is always helpful, it makes life so much easier for radar uh, identification because this acquisition auto acquisition has taken place. So yeah, um, easy enough, right? You'll get really good at this one because uh, you'll be radar identifying aircraft all day. You'll be a radar identifying uh, machine by the end of this. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this so far and I will see you at the next slide for a bulleted list to uh, kind of conclude and uh, sum this all up. See you there. Just some friendly reminders here for new aircraft to this, inform an aircraft of its position whenever radar identification is established by any of the beacon identification methods just outlined. So we talked about that already, right? Give a distance associated with it whenever you're using the beacon method. This helps you gain common ground and on the same page as the air crew, as, as the aircraft and you, because every other method we depended on a position report, either from the aircraft itself or a, report from another controller, right? So we we have been on the same page, but now we're getting on the same page with us seeing it actually take place. Uh, just a couple other things. Inform an aircraft when radar contact is lost. It's very simple phraseology. You can read about that in the 7110 at your leisure. That will happen quite a bit at San Juan's airspace, especially when you have radar surveillance uh, sites out of service for the day, maybe for repair. Whenever Pico de Este is out of service, you'll lose some aircraft in the Anada GC area, southeast of the air airspace. It's nothing to worry about. It is something to worry about when you do lose uh, radar contact and radio at the same time. Then you're looking at uh, other methods or other problems that we will get into whenever uh, you'll be trained on that accordingly for emergency procedures and stuff like that. Uh, initial radar identification in the ADC ATC system is established, right? You want to make sure that you um, let the aircraft know the radar, identif radar identified. Now that's kind of simple. It almost goes without saying, right? And subsequent to loss of radar contact or terminating radar service, radar identification is reestablished. So whenever you see an aircraft go radar contact loss, right, and you see it pop back up, just let them know their radar, they're back in radar coverage. You're seeing them again and letting them know what's uh, what's really good. So 
I know this was fast. It was a short video, relatively short video for a concept that you will use and apply uh, for the duration of your career as a controller. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, it's always a enjoyable experience to me, and I'll see you on the closing side. Well, hey there, plain people. We have come to the end of the presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed yourself. I hope you guys learned a little bit. I hope you guys now realize you have some tools in your toolbox to use. Granted, not all tools are equal, right? A nail gun is a lot more fancier and easier to use in some respects than a hammer. And a hammer is a lot better than just some blunt piece of steel to hammer a nail in, right? But now you have the whole array of radar identification methods from the most simple to uh, some that are a little complex, some are a little more labor intensive, some involve the pilot, some involve other controllers, but all of them um, are aimed at making your job of radar identifying aircraft a lot easier. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, hit me up. Always up to have some discussion on the matter. Steve signing off, and just remember, folks, may your attitude be just like your separation positive. Stay positive out there. Stay awesome. And uh, we'll see you again real soon.